Good morning. How are we doing today? Feels pretty, feels pretty nice outside. This morning, actually, we got up. Uh, Leslie and I, some of y'all know, uh, we, we run, and we get up and run on Sunday mornings even. We'll get up and go for a run, and uh, today was a good day. Uh, Leslie, she, she did six miles. She did more than me. She ran six miles straight and had a good time. And I ran five miles and, uh, and did it in the best time I've ever done it in. I ran, did it in 45 minutes. That's a nine-minute mile. It's not, not, not too shabby for a 200-pound, 44-year-old man. So, so anyway, enough about that. It is a great day. Excited to be back in the pulpit. Enjoyed last weekend. And, and I do pray that uh, you, were, you were encouraged, you were uh, re- revived somewhat from uh, the service we had. Uh, it was a blessing. What a, what a treat to have the, the uh, Lisenby family here with us for the weekend. Uh, but I am excited to be back in the pulpit and to share what, what God has laid in my heart, uh, started laying this on my heart actually before the, the revival weekend even came um, along. So just a qu- question to kind of get your minds kind of working in the direction we want to go today. Uh, have you ever been rejected? I mean, everybody in here could raise their hands. And say, I, been, you've been rejected. Uh, I mean, when, when jobs come along or, or promotion that you, you should have been a slam dunk, you've been, you've been there on the job for years and years and years, and then somebody else comes along and they get the promotion and you don't, or better yet, you know, even back in high school or, or in dating or in a relationship, there, there's this, this one, you know, this one girl or this one guy that just, you know, you just know they're the one and, uh, you, you know, you finally make the move and then uh, you get shot down, right? Down in flames, turned down, just, just rocked your world, didn't know what to do. Uh, it's heartbreaking, uh, and then go back and you're thinking about maybe when you was a kid and, uh, you know, game time would come along and uh, you, would, you would pick your teams and everybody would line up against the wall and somebody would be the captains. All right, you know, you're going to be the captain, you're the captain. Now pick teams and one by one, uh, everybody gets picked and you're the last one. Ever been, everybody been the last one to be picked? <laughs> yeah, Rod said he's been picked last lots of times. Well, that, that was their mistake. Nobody likes to be picked last. It kind of just, it kind of crushes you. You don't even want to play. I mean, if I'm going to be the last one to be picked, I just assume not even play. Well, the good news is, in, in the kingdom of God, everyone's invited. Everyone's invited. Everybody is called to play. Everyone is. Uh, the, the, that the Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his son, right? So everyone is invited. But here's the, here's the truth of the matter. In relating to God, if you're if you're not invited, if you're not included, if you feel left out, it's probably on you. It's your fault, right? It's your fault. You've chose to be left out. So we're gonna look today in a passage from from the Gospel of Luke, the great physician. I love uh, the way he writes and the way God moved him to write his gospel. It's, it's different. I mean, he's a the way he thinks. He's an educated man and he's very logical and uh, really word for word. He he wrote more Bible than almost anybody. Because you got to remember, he also wrote the book of Acts. So you're looking as far as volume, volume 1, volume 2, Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts. Uh, he really was used by God to write a lot of Bible. And we're going to look today and, and see where Jesus uh, uh, was, was invited to a dinner uh, at the home of a, of a Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees. And uh, if you know anything about the Pharisees, or most times the Pharisees are portrayed poorly in the Bible. They were very religious men, devout men of God. Uh, uh, were, were bound to the oral law, uh, very legalistic, very pious, and very um, uh, uppity. They were elitist, if you will, is a, is a word that I would look for. And so uh, they were always trying to trap Jesus and always trying to get him to do things to discredit himself. And so this is just one more attempt. So Jesus knew. I mean, one thing about Jesus is he is God, right? So it's kind of silly to think that, that, that we can get slide one by on Jesus. Do y'all know that? Does anybody still think that they can get away with stuff that Jesus don't know what you're doing now, even today? You think that you can go home and do whatever you want to do and nobody knows? God knows. It's part about all knowing, all seeing, all those things. And I, I don't say that to frighten you. I just want to remind you that if you're a believer that you are forgiven and there's grace even for those things that you still do, that you still struggle with. Right? But he knows all these things. So here you have these these Pharisees, and they say, come on, Jesus, come on over for, for, for dinner after, after, uh, uh, after you get done there. And so he should have knew something was up because the Pharisees didn't care for Jesus at all. 
But Jesus played, played along with them. So we're going to see, starting there in Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 1 and 2, we're going to see the setup. In verse 1 it says, Now it happened, as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. Right? They watched him closely. They were trying to see what he would do. They were looking for any little chink in his arm or any little thing that he would do wrong that they'd be able to accuse him on and discredit him. These Pharisees were the, were the largest and the most influential, influential religious leaders of their day. They had lots of influence. And so if you wanted something done, you went to the Pharisees and you, you would do what the Pharisees would tell you to do or you couldn't operate in, in the culture. The, the Jewish, uh, the, the marketplace, all these things, the Pharisees had much influence. But here's the problem with the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees cared about Pharisees. Pharisees cared about themselves. Pharisees only like to deal with other Pharisees. Pharisees only uh, would, would do things to, to get something back. You know, tit for tat, right? They would never just serve anyone. They would never just do something to be done to serve others. They would do it expecting something in, in return. That's what's wrong with their hearts. The word Pharisee means separated ones, right? And these guys were, were the ones who controlled the synagogues. They were the big wigs in the community. Uh, they were accredited. And this is, this is a sad thing. They were credited with taking uh, Judaism uh, and moving it from uh, a, a religion of sacrifice to a religion of law. How would you like that to be your, your history, your historical cre- accreditation to religion, is that you move things from the sacrificial system to law. That's what they're known for. So I want you just to realize, painting the picture, they weren't being polite. Right? They, weren't, they weren't being nice to Jesus. They weren't saying, well, let's, just, let's try to iron this out. Let's try to... You know, let's let's get, let's get to know the fellow. I mean, maybe we just maybe we misunderstand him. Maybe we're just you know, they weren't being polite. Their goal was to discredit Jesus. Right? And just for a side note, for us, that's what the enemy likes to do for us too. He likes to do the same thing for us to discredit us in the community, discredit us in our homes, discredit us amongst our family. You know, once you're discredited, you lose your ability to be effective. Right? You notice that. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been in your life in a career or in a workplace where you've done something uh, to, to be discredited and from then on it's a struggle? It's a struggle to, to, to be respected that whenever you say something people kind of are, are, are skeptical of you or kind of don't trust your word anymore? It happens. People's perception of you is a, rea- is a reality to them. Fair or not, that's the way it is. People, how they see you is a reality. And in our culture... I know the process, but the reality is you are guilty until proven innocent. Y'all know that? The law says otherwise, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty, but in a, in a court of public opinion, when something goes wrong, we hear something, we all guilty, right? Guilty. They need, they need to get what they deserve. Guilty until proven innocent. Pastors having affairs, those type of things. Politicians taking bribes. Lose their credibility, discredited, they're done, finished, it's over with. Billy Graham, uh, in his day, uh, would, would go to great lengths to protect himself so he wouldn't get discredited. Uh, I've, I've heard that, that what he would do when he would travel around from city to city, uh, he would never be in a, in a vehicle alone with another lady that wasn't his wife. And even in his hotel rooms, he would send a man before him into the hotel room to make sure nobody was in there to, to set up, because they would do that. What, what better way than to... Than to put an end to the Billy Graham and his, his usefulness to the gospel than to discredit him with, a, with a, a sex scandal. Somebody would place a woman in a room and he would go in there and next thing you know, somebody pops out with a camera. There you go. Finished. They was trying to discredit Jesus. It wasn't going to happen. In verse 2, he says, And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Remember I said Pharisees don't tend to hang out with anybody besides other Pharisees? You know who they surely don't hang out with? Sick people. Right? People who are defiled. Right? And this one here says this person had dropsy. Then what we would know it in a modern day terms is edema. Right? It's an inflammation, a swelling. It's fluid. That, that, that's a, a symptom of like a heart issue or a kidney issue or something like that. It's just a swelling of the tissue. And that's what it says this man had. The Pharisees would see this man as a man under judgment. They saw things as if you had something wrong with you, then apparently you had done something to deserve that. That's God's judgment. And the reason you have edema, 
probably because you're a fornicator, right? Or maybe you, you stole something, or maybe you name it. So that's how their minds worked. If you had something wrong with you, then surely it's God's judgment on you. And that's how they saw it. It was all a setup. We see now we move on to verses 3 and 6 where Jesus calls their bluff, right? Jesus knows what's going on. He sees what's happening here. In verse 3 it says, And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Can you imagine the, 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 the scribes, the lawyers, the Pharisees? They, they probably wouldn't expect that for Jesus to kind of turn the tables on them. Because right, Jesus knows, he knows the laws. Any, any good Jewish, Jewish, Jewish kid growing up understands the laws and exposed to those things, so he turns the table on them. Right, Sabbath law actually did allow for medical attention on the Sabbath. It did. Right? What happened was, was the, the, the rabbinic law, the additions to, to the law, the changes that they had added on top of the law had taken that away. They made stipulations that whereas the only, only medical attention you can get is if life is threatening. If it, can't, if it, can, if it can wait till the Sabbath is over, then you do that. And see, but they, they made that addition. Jesus knew better. Jesus knew the law, and he turned it around on them. And guess what happened when he, he did that? Crickets, silence. Verse four, but they kept silent, and he took him and he took him and healed him and let him go. Right? You love that 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 awkward silence. Whenever you you turn something or you ask a question, you hear nothing. That awkward silence that all you hear is crickets, and that's what happened. They were silent in verse four. It says, but Jesus took him and healed him. Right, no conditions for the man to be healed. Right? No conditions. He didn't say, do this, don't do that, stop doing this. Jesus healed him. Jesus simply healed the man because he had compassion for him. Right? He had compassion for him. It's the right thing to do. Right? The man didn't earn the right to be healed. Right? The man did nothing to deserve to be healed. And here's like the, the kicker of the whole thing. The man didn't even ask to be healed. Right? He was just a pawn. He was just somebody that was placed there in that situation. He was being used and got blessed. Verse 5 says, Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Jesus appealed to their common sense by personalizing it. Again, we have the silence. Jesus moves on to this isn't working. All right, let's continue with the, with the scripture. This isn't working, so let's step it up a bit. Jesus moved on to and give a parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus loved to use parables. Verses 7 through 11. He said, so he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place. Let one more honorable than you be invited by him. Uh, honorable then you be invited by him then he who invited you uh, and him come and say to you give place to this man and then you begin with shame and take the uh, I'm sorry begin with the shame to take the lowest place but when you're invited go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes uh, he may say to you friend go up higher then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you for whoever exalts himself, uh, himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Right. Right. A parable. You've heard the word used before, and I'll give you a, a definition of a parable. Uh, a parable is an extended analogy or an illustration intended to make clear a point. That's what Jesus would use these for. It's an earthly story that illustrates heavenly realities. And so what he chose to use as an illustration or the background, the backdrop for this analogy, this parable, uh, was a wedding feast. And a wedding feast in those days was the pinnacle of, of, of community events. And if you remember, even Jesus, when he started his, his ministry, it was at, at a wedding where he had to, uh, to make wine. The first, first miracle was that 
uh, to, to, to the wine had run out and he didn't want to bring shame to his mother as to her responsibility to, to provide for those things in his family. And here's the problem with the Pharisees. Again, they're thinking that they deserve everything in the best places. They, they felt entitled to the best places. And that's what this whole parable is about. And Jesus reminded them of repeatedly. If you read through that, that passage, you see it over and over again. You see the word invited, invited, invited. The Pharisees were invited guests. They weren't entitled guests. See the difference? You're, you may be invited, but it doesn't make you entitled. And that's what they were doing. They were presuming upon uh, their status. And Jesus at the end there, in verse 11, challenged them to think more humbly of themselves. He says, therefore, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. They thought that they deserved the best places. And that carried over into their relationship with God and the kingdom of heaven. And I found this quote quite helpful. It says this, uh, John MacArthur says, No one will enter the kingdom of heaven by merit, good works, righteous deeds, self-promotion, spiritual pride, or making and keeping extra biblical laws. Salvation comes only to the humble, the broken, and contrite who plead only for mercy and grace and nothing more. The Pharisees had the wrong view of who they were. They had a the wrong view of salvation. So Jesus moves on. This wasn't quite, they wasn't quite getting it yet. So Jesus continues to plug away and he gives some party advice in verses 12 to 14. He's like, because when Jesus throws a party, it's, it's not it's like the parties that we throw. He invites the people that nobody would, would invite. It says in verses 12 through 14, then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Man, can you imagine? (laughs) Almost time for more crickets, right? Right? We, we, we get that. They were stunned to silence because this isn't, they're starting to feel the weight. They should because Jesus is starting to lay it on pretty thick, isn't he? That they, they brought this guy with dropsy and put him in the midst of them and trying to, to, to test Jesus. And now Jesus is spinning things around on them. He's starting to dig and starting to step on their toes and starting to push their button and saying, when y'all have parties, all y'all do is invite other Pharisees or rich people. And that's it because you want things from them. People you can get things from. I'm saying when you throw a party, invite the lame the poor, the homeless. You know why? Because they're not going to give you nothing back. You know what they're going to do? They're just going to take. Take, take, take. You'll get no reward in this lifetime. He struck a nerve. He hit them where they, where, where they were where living at. The Pharisees just use people. And I'm reminded for myself and, and my pastor friends, we can be guilty of this same thing using our position, our influence. I'm the pastor, and so what I'll do is I'll make friends with certain people. You know, well, this guy's good at this, and I might need that down the road, right? Earning favors, doing those things. I've seen it. I've seen pastors take advantage of people doing these things because, well, I'm the pastor, and people want to love on their pastor, and that's all fine and good, but it it can be abused, right? Start to use people, not to serve people. It's a real danger in ministry. But let's look and see what the, the truth of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus expects for his people to serve with no strings attached. You hear that? No strings attached. But what if they don't? That's going to cost us a lot of money. And what are we going to get in return? You want us to throw this event and people just come for free? They're going to eat our food and, and make a mess and leave? And then what if? Right? Y'all said that, I'm sure. Try to throw, try to throw a fellowship, try, try to throw a community event, try to bring people in here, and people, their first thing is, well, well is, it, is it worth it? Are we going to get our money's worth? It's going to cost a lot of money, and, and what if nobody comes back? What's the point of the event? Are you sharing the gospel, or are you just feeding people? Is it just a, a social event, right? Earlier in the gospel, Luke says this, uh, Luke six thirty four to 36. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. 
Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. I did a sermon years ago, and the, 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 the title of my sermon was Whoop, Whoop-de-doo. Right? And that's what he's saying here. You want to translate that down to, you know, you serve and you give to people that, that can pay you back? Right? The Hebrew word, whoop de doo Right? Who cares? He also goes on to say that Jesus expects for his people to love the ones that no one else will love. Right? It's easy to... It's expected and right that you love your family, right? If you don't love your family, that's, that's a whole other issue. But what's unnatural and what, what draws people's attention is for you to love the ones that nobody will love. Matthew five forty six says this, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Right? Again, whoop de doo this is what he's saying. Tax collectors. Do you all know how tax collectors were viewed? In those days, about the same as they're viewed nowadays, right? Not much has changed. Uh, very disrespectful that, that people had very low, uh, uh, didn't care for them too much. They were hated, and that's what the analogy that was being used there, that, that tax collectors even do the same thing. Our time of reward will be in heaven. That's it. Don't do things for the here and now. Don't, don't, don't look to be rewarded now. Don't look for to, to be made much of now. Your reward will be in heaven if you're in Christ. The Pharisees totally missed the point of what Jesus was saying. And then verse 15, this is kind of funny. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. What a strange statement. Right? It's almost like the, 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 this man was feeling the weight of the conversation and it was getting a little too heavy for him. So we kind of put the awkward smile on his face and got his cup up and made a toast. Right? And, but nobody's laughing. He's trying to lighten the mood, trying to turn things around, making an awkward toast. And you know, things were going really bad. And to be, truth be told, what it was, it was a rebuke to Jesus. It was basically saying that, no, 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 we're right, you're wrong. We are going to be in the kingdom of heaven. We, we are the righteous. And all this stuff you're saying, you're, you're backwards. You got this wrong. So Jesus continued on. Another parable. Verses 16 to 24. Verses 16 and 17 says this. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. I was like, Oh, get their attention. Oh, another parable. Let me start putting together these characters here. Uh, we, we say a certain man. A certain man would be, in this instance, the parable would be God himself. And then you talk about the, the, a great supper uh, would be referring to what we would know as the, 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 the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, right? When you, you read the, the book of Revelation, that's what we're referring to. When it says there that, that, that many were invited, or invited many, and you know who the original invitation was to? Israel, right? Israel, the, the, the Jews, they, they, they were uh, uh, his chosen people. Salvation was always to the Jew first. Uh, they were, and listen to me, they were and are God's chosen people, right? The church didn't replace uh, uh, Israel. It has not. It has not and will not, right? They are his chosen people. And it goes on to the end there, this word, it kind of, if you don't, you'll just pass right over it if you don't look at it closely. The word come, right? Come. It's one of the greatest words that we have in the Bible. Come. Isaiah 45, 20 to 22 says this, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Uh, who has declared this from ancient times? Who has told it from the, that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior? 
There is none besides me. And in verse 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Come. And in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Comes. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is still saying the same thing this morning. Come. Come. Now, when I was a, a, a young boy, I made the mistake of not coming when my dad said to come. Uh, I was across the, 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 the road at a friend's house, and we were playing out back in the, in the woods. Y'all remember that when we were kids and you actually played outside in the woods? Anybody remember that? Yeah, we all did. You had ticks and red bugs and all kind of nasty stuff from playing out in the woods. Well, I heard him. It was supper time. I, my dad got and you know, Mike! And I, I heard him and I said, yeah, I'm coming. All right, kept on playing and, you know, about 20 minutes passed. You're a kid, you know, you lose track of time. You're not really sure what time it is. And, you know, I, I come to the house and, and, and daddy's waiting on me. He is waiting on me, and he don't look too happy. And as soon as I step th- break through that door, uh, you ever have somebody grab you by the hair or the head on the back of your neck, like down low, like where the, the hairline is? Everybody experienced that? No? I guess I, I guess I was abused. He grabbed me by the hair and, uh, and give me a little sermon about coming when he says to come. Right? That, and that's my, my earthly father. When, when God says to come, you come. Right? You come. And it says also in this verse, uh, this passage, it says that all things are now ready. Of course, in the parable, you're talking about a meal, but what he was saying, uh, the analogy there, that the true Messiah of God had arrived. That's what he was saying to the Pharisees, right? The, the gathering of the Jews. The, the, the meal is ready. All things are now ready. Jesus, the Redeemer, had come. Here's the problem. The Jews were looking for another king like David. Right? They wanted the glory days. They, they knew there was a Messiah to come, but they wanted another, another king like David. They wanted to be the, the, the big boys on the block again because right now Rome was. And they were oppressed and they didn't have the power that they once had. And they were looking for another earthly king, another Messiah like David. Not a working class carpenter from Nazareth. You kidding me? From Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. And this guy is supposed to be our Savior? This is the Messiah? Are you kidding me? Guys from Oakdale, really? Anybody from Oakdale? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know what else to say. I didn't know what else to say. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to give you give you an idea of you know what people would never expect him to come from. Let me just take a, a little pause and remind you guys this morning, here this morning, this time we have together, unbelievers that are here this morning, unbelievers that are here this morning. All things are ready. They're still ready, right? For you to be made right with God. Jesus came and lived a sinless life because you couldn't. Jesus died a sinner's death so you wouldn't. And Jesus rose again on the third day and is coming back to claim his bride, the church. Right? When Jesus said it is finished, that's what he meant. It's finished. There's nothing else to be done. So, Jesus first volley, and now he laid all the cards on the table, and then the excuses begin, like we do. Right? Anybody in here like to make excuses? I can't because this, and I was doing that, but, and if, ands, and all those things, and they do the same thing here. Uh, but this time it has eternal ramifications, and you make these kind of excuses. When Jesus says come, and you make excuses, it turns out poorly in the end. Look at verse 18, starting back. It says, But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. <laughs> really? And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Hmm. Really? Really. It says they all with one accord. This shows premeditation. 
it was a joint decision. That this, they've, they've got together and decided that we're not going to participate. We've, we've decided that, that Jesus, we voted. We voted and Jesus, Jesus is not the Messiah. We've, we've determined that he's not the Messiah. So I guess they thought maybe we'll just make excuses. That's less hurtful. We won't just straight up say, we know we're, we're not going to come. We make excuses about why we don't want to come. The truth is Jesus wasn't the Savior that they wanted. That's the reality. He wasn't. And I think that's the problem with our culture today. It's still the same, that, that Jesus isn't the Savior that you want. He doesn't act the way that you want him to act and doesn't allow you to sin the way that you want to sin. So you just say no, make excuses. I'm not coming. And these excuses had no merit, none of them. Said I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. Uh, you know, the, the land would still be there after the banquet, right? You can see it then, right? Then nobody buys land without seeing it first, unless you're a sucker, right? I'm not going to just go plop down a bunch of money to buy some land I've never seen before. It doesn't even make sense. It made no sense. It just shows that it was a, a lie from the beginning. And the second one there, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. Really? Again, the oxen would still be there. They're not going anywhere. They'd be tied up or in a, in a pen. And just think about to, to be able to afford to buy that many oxen at once. Uh, this had to, they had to be rich. Right? The guy, they had, they, you had to be rich. And you could have a servant to do that. You don't do that yourself. You don't need to do that yourself. A servant could do that. So that excuse had no weight as well. And then the last one is probably the most laughable of all. It says, I have married a wife. And, and uh, ladies, in the 21st century, y'all may still feel like y'all are oppressed and St. class citizens, but you don't have no clue of what it was like for, for women in the first century. Uh, you, you were just like property. And you you're, you're basically was there to, to bear children. That's pretty much it. And so for them to say this uh, it made no sense because uh, women did not dictate to men what they did or didn't do, period. So it wouldn't be an excuse. It had, it had no weight. It, wasn't, it was just a made-up thing. It was a lie. All these were, were sad excuses, poor excuses. Before we look at them and say, those are pretty pathetic, I've got some of our own. We have excuses of our own. I've heard many in my time. The, the, the first one, and probably the biggest one, is that there are too many hypocrites in the church. Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah, yeah. And I would say true enough, but there's always room for one more. Come on in. Right? The next one, I just don't, I just don't feel it. What, is, what does that even mean? All right? What does that even mean that you don't even feel it? Where in the scriptures does it say to, or talk about us feeling like we're ready to be saved? I don't get that one. And then the next one is that there, there's, there's just too much to give up. And I'd say, like, what? Because a pastor asked me that question and whenever he, when he came to share the gospel with me. And I just, you know, I knew that I needed to, to get things right and I didn't understand. He was like, so what do you feel that God's asking you to give up? And I was like, I don't know nothing. He said, so what's your problem? He said, I don't know. He says, what, what do I need to do? How does, how does this need to, to work? And he says, just, just pray. Ask God to, to forgive you of your sins and to surrender your life to him. And, and I did. And that was that. Right? And it doesn't make sense to, to give up. There's too much to give up. And you see that in Mark 8, 36 and 37 talks about that. It doesn't make any sense. That's for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Really? It's too much to give up. I, I'd rather keep doing what I'm doing. It's more important to me. You'd rather lose your soul than surrender. And then here's another one, too. Some people just feel like they're just too dirty. They've gone too far. I'm too great a sinner. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Does anybody, you know, if you're familiar with your Bible at all, you've read through the Scriptures, do you ever see Jesus saying No. To somebody who comes, no, 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 you, you're too far gone. You're too far gone. You're, you're, I, I tell you what, I've, I've been around some shady people. I've been, I've, look, I've seen, I've seen some horrible people, and, and you're worse than all of them. And so, nope, nope. Have you ever seen that? I haven't either. And if you do find it, let me know. I, I'd like to see it. But I don't think you're going to find that. And then here's the, the, the worst of all. 
I'll do it later, but not today. I'll do it later, but not today. You're playing a dangerous game, a dangerous game with your eternity. You know, I think of, you know, I've shared before, and I think of when 9-11 happened, you know, just in seeing those, those, those towers crumble, how many people, you know, were affected that day that were going to make a decision for Christ? Right? I'm going to. I will. I'm just not quite ready yet. I'm, I'm just not quite ready. I'll, I'll do it later, but not today. And, and, and that day never came, did it? Never came. They weren't expecting for some fool to fly a plane into the, into the, the building. Who does that? Right? Tomorrow never came. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. No better time than now. Why wait? Why wait? Just like it was for the Pharisees, just like it is for us, there are no acceptable excuses for rejecting Jesus. Nothing will be accepted. The Jews' loss was our gain. Let's finish up here. Verses 21 to 24. It says, So that the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Wow, you think he got the Pharisees' attention now? The master of the house being angry. Right? What an insult. How disrespectful. They'd understand that. This, you know, in an analogy of, the, the, of the, the banquet or wedding feast, how disrespectful to the family, to the father over this whole thing. But how much more so to say that God has provided a way for you to be right with him, offered his own son, gave his only son, and you say no thanks. No, no thanks. I'll pass. How disrespectful. It, it says that he was angry. So we quickly, it says there, quickly, no hesitation, Guess what? God was going to save somebody. He was going to save somebody. You don't want it. I'm going on. To, I'm moving on. Right? You, you're too proud. Y'all think y'all entitled. Y'all think this is for you. And you reject my son. You reject me. I'm moving on. He says to go out in the streets and the and, and, uh, and, and streets and lanes. Talk about the local area. Just right outside. Just outside the, the, the home there. And the poor and the maimed is what he says there. The lame and the blind. Uh, and the ironic thing is that God uh, used here, or Jesus used here in this analogy, the ones that the Pharisees would reject and would never invite to their gatherings. This is the one that Jesus says, I'm, they're, they're getting your blessing. They're, gonna, they're the ones who are going to come. The offer was made to you. You said no. Therefore, I'm moving on. In verse 22, And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of the, those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Definitely more crickets then. Probably some weeping, right? Some sadness. They think about that way. When he says, In the highways and hedges, uh, this would be even further. The, 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 the first little calling was the locals, the, 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 the inner city people. Now, these are the ones, highways and hedges were the further ones. These were some really shady individuals that lived out on the outskirts of town. All right? That's what he's talking about. Those, those are, the ones you say are really bad people, that's what I'm talking about. Invite them to come. It says, my house may be filled with what, what God desires. There will be no empty chairs at God's dinner table. When this thing all wraps up, there'll be no empty chairs. It's going to be full. The question is whether you're going to be in one of those chairs or not. Whether you're going to reject Jesus or going to keep making excuses. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? All should come to repentance. When Jesus wrapped up there in the end of his parable when he says this when he, in verse 24 for i say to you that none of those men were invited shall taste my supper when he says i say to you that's jesus wrapping it up that's nailing it down when he says that verily verily i say unto you i say to you he nailed it down none of those men those that made excuses and would not come when the meal is ready 
Right? When Jesus was revealed as the Messiah, that's what he's referring to, will not come. Those who say no to Jesus now will not come. You refuse to come to Jesus now, at the end, you will not, be, you will not come. You will not be there. By rejecting Jesus, they reject their only hope for right relationship with God. And it's the same for us today. It's still the same. So I'll close with this. Pharisees assume their place with God was secure because of their bloodline connection to Abraham, right? We're the sense of Abraham, and therefore we're right with God. We are your chosen people. That's what they thought. Religious observances, keeping the law, being, you know, being good, whatever that means. They were wrong. Same for them. It was by faith. Same thing as it is for us. And so some here this morning may assume that your place with God is secure also because you're a good person. Whatever that means. Maybe your family's, you know, active in church. Your mom and daddy's saved and, you know, a, a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or whatever. So you think that because your parents are saved and your parents are godly that you think that you're okay too. Right? You're wrong too. You're wrong as well. Right? There's only one way that anyone's place with God is secure. Only one way. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it's by grace through faith in Jesus. Period. Period. Period exclamation point, if you want to add. We must repent of our sinful ways. I, I, was, I was so thankful that uh, Brother Ricky last weekend really, really hammered that home. That, you know, it is by faith through grace we believe, but it's also evidenced by repentance that we stop. Right? We turn and go the other way. That, that our, our faith is, is, is evidenced by our repentance. When we turn from our sin, we turn to Jesus. So I'll end like this. The invitation still stands this morning. Will you accept Jesus' invitation? Or will you keep making excuses? Will you keep making excuses? I just want you to know that you are invited. Let's pray, and we'll have a moment of invitation. Father, what a powerful text. Father, where we may see ourselves in these Pharisees, where we may see ourselves as, as entitled, and we may see ourselves as being better than others, God. And Father, we, we might even see ourselves uh, with a Pharisee and how we have rejected Jesus. And then, Father, that we... Uh, we choose to go our own way. And so, Father, I pray uh, that this morning uh, that those that are here, Father, that, that hear, hear my voice would, would, would be called by your Spirit, God. Today is the day of salvation, Father, that the invitation still stands. Father, while there's dre- uh, breath in the lungs and there's uh, uh, blood in the veins, God, that, that the invitation still stands. And there is no other way uh, for, to be right with you, Father, that... that only through Christ is there salvation, Father, that, that repentance would be had. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And, Father, I thank you for this time now where we can respond to you. And so, Father, I pray for courage for everyone here this morning, God, that uh, they would deal with you in the way it needs to be done. Father, for those that don't know you, uh, I pray that they would have courage this morning to say yes to Jesus. And, Father, that, that today... Uh, the invitation would be accepted. And Father, for uh, your church, your people, and God, I, I pray that, that we would be reminded of, and of how thankful that we should be that we indeed are invited, that you have indeed invited us uh, to, to be in a right relationship with you, that we will indeed spend eternity with you, and that eternal life begins now, that you are with us now, uh, Father. So God, uh, just move in these, these final moments of our time together this morning, Father. And we thank you now for what you'll do. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.